Capital Group, Grassroots uh -huh. uh -huh. Socialist uh -huh. Experiment. Uh -huh. yeah. And also there is another guy, um, Jacek Kotarowski. Jacek Kotarowski, uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. uh, uh, typical yeah. Polish name, yeah. So, indeed, this talk, uh, I'm very pleased for the invitation, but the name, Sciences Nucleares, it's nice, but my talk is not about sciences nuclear, but no, about general no, quantum. Uh, no, but it's confirmed by several departments. Yes. Aha, uh -huh. okay, 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 okay. Two every week? Organized? Every month. Every month. Every ah, month. Ah, ah. But then uh, people from the physics department or Institute of the Physics, are they? Come here sometimes. They used to come. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. Actually, so we have a few people from the institute. of the semester. Uh, it's my pleasure to present Professor Karol Sikowski from the Jagiellonia University in Krakow, Poland, who will talk about quantum entanglement and its geometry. So, please. Thank you very much, muchas gracias for your invitation. I'm very, very pleased to be here and I'm privileged to deliver a talk in such a great aula magnum. Um, indeed, I am guest of uh, Institute of the Sciences Nucleares, even though uh, I, have, I have a lot of colleagues working in nuclear physics, but I'm mostly interested in quantum theory, which I hope will be of general interest for all of you. So I enjoy um, Mexico and UNAM very, very much. First day after I arrived, I saw Puma bus with Puma. I was very much well, impressed by it, but I could not imagine that next day I was showing the Puma life here. And I just sent it to uh, my family, so my daughter said, oh, it's a really good idea to think, to study here, with such a pumas around. Yeah. So, the subject of my talk is very simple, some quantum mechanics for beginners. Basically, well, uh, simplest possible setup is we we'll talk in our jargon about Quantum bits. What is a qubit? You know the world, of course, very well. First, we start with a bit. Bit corresponds to binary unit. N is equal to 2. Something is equal to 2. N is for us the size of the Hilbert space. The simplest non-trivial Hilbert space is of size 2. And qubit is just quantum bit. So quantum binary unit. So we discuss all states that are now states. Pure states are just elements of complex Hilbert space. And we normalize them, and we assume that we consider equivalence classes, so the overall phase is not important, and then it's easy to show, if you choose a basis like 0 and 1, 
here is one state, here another, then the set of all pure states of a qubit forms a famous sphere we used to call Bloch sphere. By the way, now I'm happy because Bloch, of course, is related to nuclear physics, so I can show this kind of relation of Bloch physics and nuclear physics. So the name Bloch ball or Bloch sphere comes from, I think, Fertis, where he was making experiments in nuclear physics. So now, if I put those complex coefficients, I prefer to use here cosine theta over 2 and here e to i phi because if I use those two angles here the word geometry I use my title I can take literally why? with those variables the set of pure states corresponds to what? so in Spanish geo is terrorized to the earth so the geographic those two numbers are just in geography they are called latitude and longitude so of course, uh, here is a pole, here is the equator, so Mexico is somewhere here, uh, Poland is there, and for any point at the sphere, so at the earth, we can find corresponding quantum state. And classical states are just those zero, L and one, up or down. So I have here a Mexican coin I will use, so there are heads or tails, well there are no heads here. Yeah? What's here? What is this? It's not, uh, how you say it in Spanish? Aguina. Aguina. So heads or tails, one or zero, there are only two classical states. Quantum mechanically we change. We embed the space of classical states into entire block sphere. And the key feature, key quantum feature, is just those states which are in superposition. It's called quantum superposition or coherent superposition, not a mixture between two states, and they form our Bloch sphere. For instance, key states are just those plus or minus, they are opposite, orthogonal, they are just superposition with arbitrary phase, here I choose plus and here minus. Well, in physics we are not only interested in describing how the things look like, but how they change in time. We are interested in evolution. Simplest possible evolution of a ball, well, you can guess, is just rotation. This is like a block ball, it can rotate. So for us, a state in a standard picture, there's a unitary rotation. So you, we take a, a state, and we, uh, for every state psi, we write psi prime as u acting on psi, use a unitary matrix which describes a rotation of the block ball, block sphere, and we get the transformed state psi. To discuss distance between two states, well, I mentioned already analogy to geography. In geography, the distance between Krakow and Mexico City, usually we consider geodesic distance at the sphere. So in the space of states, we can use a similar notion. Mm, for any two states, we can continue, uh, compute its so-called overlap, of absolute values of this overlap, because they are complex numbers, and then the arc cosine of this number, it is sometimes called Fubini study distance. Technically, those states are elements of complex projective space. We don't need to care too much about it. This is complex projective space, and then mathematically speaking, there's a natural distance from any study, which for n equal 2 corresponds just to standard geodesic distance from Mexico to Krakow at this field. Now, the key observation is that if we take two states and we transform both of them, since this is a rotation, the distance does not change. Why? Because overlap or square or overlap does not change if both states are transformed unitary. Because you see here, here is you, here you dagger, so this cancels, and the standard evolution can be considered as isometry. It's only a rotation, so the distance between two states, if they evolve in time unitarily, does not change. By the way, there is a well-defined field, so-called quantum chaos. It means you have a classically chaotic system where two trajectories diverge in time, and you look for the corresponding quantum systems. So you might think, well, something is strange, because classically it's of course easy to see there are two points which diverge in time exponentially fast, and there are 
told you that, well, for the quantum states in the standard evolution, it's a rotation, so the distance does not change. So people study this problem for a long, long time, and there's a quite a field of quantum chaology. So in a sense, the key point, n is size of the Hilbert space. If you go with n to infinity, you can consider it's like a classical limit, and the key observation is that those two limits, time to infinity in the evolution, and n to infinity, so classical limit, do not commute. This is just kind of argument why there is kind of no contradiction between in relation to chaotic, classically chaotic dynamics. Now a short question, what can you see? You can see two gentlemen, what they are doing? Possibly talking. More than very quite interesting issue, what they are talking about. Of course, you cannot guess. I will tell you, they are talking mathematics. Maybe not physics, but mathematics. Well, maybe you know the names. Nikodem, there is Nikodem derivative. Otto Nikodem and Stefan Banach, I guess you know the name. They met once upon a time in Krakow, city I was born, and they were talking at the bench at the Planty Garden in summer 1916. I will refer to this story later. As you can guess, maybe some of you know, in Poland, the Europe, it was not a very good time. It was just the middle of the First World War, 1916. So I will uh, go back to this story later. Now, let me tell you something about mixed quantum states. Before I discuss pure states, pure states are elements of the Hilbert space. Now, I can discuss not only pure state, this is a pure state, but now I can take a projector onto pure state. Let me remind you, this is our slang cat, this is bra, uh, this cat bra is already in matrix, it's an operator. It's a projection operator onto a given state. So now we can have a convex combination of those projectors, we call it mixed state. Mixed here is a mixture, so AI are just arbitrary mixture coefficients, they are non-negative and they sum to unity. Therefore, we use the name mixed state. Sometimes we also work with the use the name quantum state, mixed state, or density matrix. What are the density matrix? Of course, I, you know, but I will just recall. So, we have, we fix the size of the Hilbert space, and Rho's operator, so this density operator, which acts in this complex Hilbert space, we assume this a Hermitian operator, self adjoint, is positively defined, and trace is equal to 1. So there is a normalization which reflects the fact that probability is conserved. Sum of all probabilities is equal to 1. And now, let me denote by mn the set of all those states of a given size. For n equal 2, the situation is simple. Set of pure states, it was a sphere. Set of mixed states is just all possible convex combination. If you take a point at the sphere, you take all possible convex combinations, what can you get? This is simple, you get the full ball. Instead of a hollow sphere, you get a full ball. So not only in geographic terms, maybe it's related, related not only to geography, but geology. Because where everything inside is also interesting. For geology, of course, this what is inside the elephant is also important. So you see, the difference between pure states and mixed states is like relation between geography and geology, in some sense. But look, this is simple for n equal to, for a qubit. In general, it's more complicated. In mathematical terms, you can say that a set of positive matrices forms a cone. It's a cone, uh, well, but cone in the larger dimensional space. And now, trace rho is equal to 1. This is a normalization condition. This is like a hyperplane, this blue hyperplane. So our set of states is a kind of cross-section of this cone, which goes to infinity, with this plane, and therefore, it's a finite dimensional body. Body means convex set. The set is convex. And it has a finite volume. So look, for n equal 2, we know how the set of mixed states looks like. It's an interior of the sphere, so a ball. Now the question comes, how the set of all states of size, for instance, 3, is the second case, it looks like. Well, it's a bit more complicated. First of all, first claim is, okay, I was not able to take it with me to Mexico. I like to take different gadgets with me. Why was it possible to take it to Mexico? Not because of custom officers at the border, but because, this, because of what? The set is eight-dimensional, so I could not bring it with me. This set lives in eight dimensions. Why eight? Who knows? n squared minus one. We have matrix of size n, n squared for three is nine minus one because of trace. Preserving condition is 8. So this is the 8-dimensional set. 
In short, I don't know how it looks like. In eight dimensions, well, we used to work on it for many years. Honestly, I still don't know how it looks like. But, well, we worked somehow on it and we wish to know how this set looks like. What is the geometry of this set? First, we know it's a bit special set because it's pure state, so X3 by points, form only four dimensional set of pure states. This is complex projective manifold CP2 I discussed before. And the boundary of this eight dimensional object has seven dimensions. Well, so the question is, in a sense, how this eight dimensional object looks like? Since I cannot tell you how it looks like, I can use so called apophatic approach. It means I can show you how it does not look like. Apophatic means kind by contradiction. This is easier to, uh, to work with. So, in the apophatic approach, First question is, I will show you some objects and ask you why they work in the apophatic approach. So why there are examples, how our set does not look like. For instance, uh, why this is not a good model of the set of mixed states? Yes, yes, exactly. This is not a convex set. So I just went to the, as my kids were young, I went to the room and I took some objects. So this is exactly this. So of course it's a nice example of a non-convex set, yes? So it's not, our set is not like this. What comes next? Okay, this is simple. Well, we know that for n equal 2, it is a ball. But for n equal 3, it is not a ball. It's not an 8 ball. This is simple. Mm, what else? Okay, so here is something different. What is this? Whatever, but this is a poly, not polygon, polyhedra, or polytope. This is also a T, uh, it is a polytope. We know it's not a polytope. But it's more complicated. It has some flat parts and some round parts. It's neither a ball nor a polytope. What then? Look, this is a better model. It's just a cylinder. It has some round parts and some flat parts. Yes? So now, a more sophisticated question. Again, why it is in apophatic approach a model which our set, what is the property missing here? So to make this answer easier, so you know what I'm talking about. This is some object, and I wish to know why this is a model how our set does not look like. So to make it easier, I, you see I use colors here. So what is colored? This is the set of, in the case of cylinder, what are extremal points? One ring here, circle, one circle there. If you take convex hull of two, those two rings, you will get entire cylinder. Yes? So now, you, how do you think? What is missing in this object? Yes, very well, very well. Good answer, yes. Five points, yes. So I will repeat. The, what is missing, the set of pure states should be connected. But I can cure it. Look. Now it's better. So what I did? I did this. Now I somehow repaired this um, missing part. Now you see the set of all pure states. So those external points is connected. Please show it. Please pass it over. So, and by the way, this object, how, now look, what is the relation to, I don't know, tennis or maybe here is possible, uh, more popular baseball? Yes? What do you play in Mexico? Soccer, no, 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 I don't know. I will only, no, no. Sorry, 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 I only need such uh, objects in uh, this shape. So, how, what is the relation to this tennis ball? Of this, how do you think? Let's imagine you got the ball, tennis ball, made out of gold, like El Dorado, and you are allowed to cut as much as you wish, with a knife, huge knife, but you are not allowed to touch the seam. So you have to cut something away. By the way, how do you think, how many, how much, what is the percentage of the volume you are allowed to take out of this ball, not touching the seam? This is the answer, almost half of it. Oops, sorry, this goes this direction. Here. You see, this is the sphere, and here is a convex hull, it's almost convex hull of the seam of the tennis ball. Almost half of this is taken away. This is convex hull of the seam. And this is more or less this object you see. So in a sense, this is a bit, okay. I don't know how this set looks like. 
I know how it does not look like, but in some sense, a piece of block, a great ball, I discussed the set of pure states, which is in some sense uniquely connected, and I take convex hull of it. And what you will get, taking convex hull, is this object, which is more or less this one I showed to you. Are you with me? This is to understand geometry of the set of mixed states. Yes, now I will show you uh, one picture from my city, Krakow. This to lie there and the Wawel Castle. So by the way, uh, somebody asked me, my university is called Jagiellonski, so Jagiellonian, Jagiellonian. There was a dynasty of kings living there many years ago. And this picture will be important in, uh, shortly. Now, look, I first admitted I do not know how this set looks like, because it's eight-dimensional. For larger n, it's even more, and square dimension. In apophatic approach, I try to show you how it does not look like. But if you don't like this approach, I will then try to advocate more constructive approach. For instance, there's a huge a set of huge dimensionality, 8 for instance. So what can I do with this 8 dimensional set? I can study, for instance, cross sections or projections. So you can imagine, there's an 8 dimensional object, which I cannot bring here, and I can look into cross section in 2 or 3 dimensions. Yes, this is just to get some orientation how it looks like. And then I will also, sometimes it will be useful to distinguish some separable states, and we can also, we we'll later on, discuss entangled states, can also look at the projections of those sets onto a plate. Well, and then I will need a simple mathematical notion, which is, by the way, known for 100 years, and we know it implicitly, but not explicitly. Here, for any operator A, so matrix for us, one defines numerical range, sometimes called field of values, and you denote it often with letter W because of very performing letter of Dutch. And so it was uh, the key results by Hausdorff and Teplitz, I think, 100 years ago. And the definition is simple. For any operator, you take normalized states and you look at the expectation values among any pure states. So for us, it's a very simple notion. We take all possible expectation values of a given operator in any normalized state. Now look, if this matrix is Hermitian, so A is equal to a, uh, a joint, so of course we know very well that the spectrum of such a matrix is linear, you can order it from lambda 1 to lambda, let's say, n, in this case lambda 4, and it's easy to show that this numerical range it is just a set from the smallest to the largest eigenvalue. So it's a range, a segment of the line before the name. Range. It is numerical range. So this is because the operator is Hermitian. In general, for non-Hermitian operators, this numerical range forms a set at the complex plane. And then I mentioned already those German uh, scientists, mathematicians, there is a very famous theorem by Hausdorff and Teplitz. By the way, it was proven some uh, exactly 100 years ago, in 1919, and there will be a huge mathematical conference on these topics to commemorate uh, this theorem. And it, this theorem says that for any A, this is a convex set on the complex plane. Well, more or less look like, like this. There are examples for random matrices of order 6, and the red dots denote eigenvalues. So this set, of course, includes all eigenvalues. In the general case for a non-normal operator, in Hermitian, of course, you have such a nice smooth boundary. And in the case of a normal operator, normal it is such that it commutes with its adjoint. There is a nice theorem which tells that this numerical range is just convex hull of the spectrum. You here see eigenvalues, so it's a polygon. Now look, this is simple, so this is known mathematics for 100 years. So two points. First, it is, could be of interest to us, because there are the expectation values we use every, almost every day, maybe, in quantum theory. And second, to be related to our set of mixed states. For instance, if you, some examples. If you take n equal to non Hermitian matrix with spectrum two complex numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, then, so it's a normal matrix, then this numerical range is just a segment from lambda 1 to lambda 2. If you have matrix of size 3 with three eigenvalues, 1, 2, 3, numerical range, the set of all possible expectation values is just a 
triangle. Convex hull of three points is triangle. Well, if you take not normal matrices, for instance, if you take a non-normal matrix of size 2, then a theorem which is also like 80 years old tells that for any matrix of size 2, this numerical range is an elliptical disk with two eigenvalues placed at the focal points of this ellipse. For instance, if you take this Jordan matrix, like very nice not normal matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, you see eigenvalues are zeros and zeros. Yes, you know, there are two eigenvalues equal to zeros, and this ellipse has special shape. What kind of shape? A circle. Full circle. The numerical range of this ellipse is just a disk. This disk centered at zero, r is one half. But now look, I, what would be the relation to physics? I told you, this is easy to believe, that the set of all mixed states of size two is just a ball. So, how do you think? Is there any relation between this ball here and this uh, ellipse or disk uh, found by mathematicians many years ago? Well, look, unfortunately, what can I do? I'm not high enough, no, I will do an experiment. Oh, 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 yes. What have you seen? You have a, well, a shadow, you have a scene, let's try again. Oh, okay, you can see a shadow of the ball. Uh, usually if there's a small room, I can put uh, my ball on the um, beam of light, and then, of course, the shadow you will see will be a disk, but if you tilt the screen, it could also be an ellipse. And this is the point. So the point is, um, here is again examples of those numerical uh, ranges I mentioned is just a full circle or an ellipse. I will return to this point later. Here is again a picture of Wawel Castle in Krakow. So this is the Vistula River. First picture was done from this place. Now I show you another picture. Look, just to formulate a mathematical theorem. This is a theorem of my friends, the Antarctic Shoftishers. You see here a red arrow. So the theorem goes like this. With probability 1 minus epsilon, the bench Banach talked to Nikodin in 1916, was localized in Ita neighborhood of this red arrow. As you can guess, they, still, they are mathematicians. They still work how to relate epsilon with eta. We don't know what is the relation between those two numbers. Uh, look, it was like this. A short, a long story short. Banach, just during the First World War, was out of the studies because he studied in Lemberg, which was taken by Russia, he had nothing better to do. He was living in Krakow but not doing science. But he talked to Nikodin, which was his friend. And they talked sitting at the bench, and then they talked about strange thing, about Lebec Integral, which it was in 1916. And Lebec Integral was invented in 1905 by Lebec in France. And then Steinhaus was already PhD in mathematics. He was a professional mathematician. He was passing by, and could, he was very much amazed. He could not help overhearing that some two young guys are talking about Lebec Integral during the war very close to the front. He was very much amazed, and he introduced himself and joined the discussion. And basically, this was the key moment starting somehow the later developed Polish School of Mathematics. Later, Steinhaus got a position in Wolf, and he somehow managed to help Banach to get his position. So Steinhaus himself had a lot of nice mathematical results, but if later on he wrote in his memoirs, if somebody asked him what his, is his greatest mathematical achievement or discovery, his answer was very short, Banach, Banach himself. So he realized, that because Banach, uh, he dropped out of the studies, he, was not, he, he has never got a uh, master's uh, degree, then he hardly got PhD degree, but because of Steinhaus, who was his kind of mentor, he uh, eventually got a professorship position and in some sense invented entire functional analysis and became a well-known mathematics professor in the late 20s. So, exactly 100 years later, after this discussion, there was a bench erected in Krakow. If you ever uh, be around, please go and see. There's a Polish longer uh, story. I will read the shorter one in English. Otto Nikodem here and Stefan Banach in conversation about mathematics. 
This bench memorizes the famous meeting with Hugo Steinhaus in the Plante Garden in summer 16. Now you can say, well, but we are physicists, why should we care? Of course we like Banach spaces and so on. There is one more point, maybe not so well known. This was in 1916. Then Banach, you know, he almost survived the war, so he passed away, he was so ill during the war, he passed away in 46. Uh, yes. And he never returned to Poland. But um, Otto Nikodem survived the war, he went to uh, US, and then he uh, continued his mathematical career, but later he wrote an interesting book in 1966. Fifty years later, he wrote a book, Mathematical Apparatus for Quantum Theories. So in a sense, quantum mechanics is also somehow in our field related to this, uh, those people, so therefore I told you this story. Well, now I show you some images of some shadows. If you see some object, you can look what is its shadow. For instance, this is a ball, here you have a shadow, here is like a tetrahedron, yeah, here it is, so you can look for what is its shadow. And from the shadows, if you rotate your object, if you have more and more pictures like this, you can somehow guess how the object looks like, yes? By the way, this is related, how it is related to our story. There is this famous idea of tomography, which basically it is this, and this tomography is related to, to what, to some, there is some mm, Nicodem, integral Nicodem. So anyway, this, there are some relations to the theorem of uh, Nicodem inside. It's called Nicodem. Okay. Uh, uh, well, there, are, there is a deep mathematics inside. However, we wish to understand what is the geometry of the set in many dimensions. And we only look at its, um, at its projections. So, our key observation is the following. What is now the relation between the set of mixed states, like the ball, and those numerical ranges? This is the point. If you take first the set of classical states, like probability vectors for n equal 4 is just a tetrahedron, and this is the set of all classical states, and consider orthogonal projections onto a two plane, so you look at the all possible shadows of tetrahedron at the plane, what you get, you get a polygon. And this is the set of all possible projections of the set of classical states on the plane is equivalent up to uh, a fine transformation to the number, all possible numerical ranges of all normal matrices of a given size. And now if you take to uh, go to quantum states, there is a similar statement that if you fix dimension, for instance two, the set of quantum states is a ball, then the set of all possible projections of this set onto a plane is up to a fine transformation equivalent to all possible shapes of numerical ranges of all matrices of a given size. So, for n equal to, all possible numerical ranges form an ellipse. Why? Because the shadow of a block ball is always an ellipse. So what it means? That if we study those numerical ranges, we can see what are the projections of this huge dimensional object onto the plane. So here are some examples of size fairly this is the general case. Here you see there's one flat part, two flat parts, and three flat parts. This is the polygon, which is corresponds to normal matrix. And they are more or less classified. Now, you can also have the idea to take not two expectation values, but three expectation values. So we take three different operators, let's assume they are Hermitian. Physically, we make a triple measurement. We take, measure three observables, A1, A2, A3. And we look at all possible sets of the joint results of joint measurement. And this is, mathematically speaking, joint numerical range. If there are three observables, you get objects in 3D. There are objects basically look, look like this. So there should be a model of this here. So please have a look. This is done, you know, there's a 3D printer which you can use for very many different purposes. For instance, to print such objects like this. 
Um, and this is my student who was responsible for producing it, and she knows how to do it. So what you need for such an object, you need a 3D printer, a good software, and a clever student. This is enough. So I was very lucky that I had three of those. Um, look, in some sense, now let me go to a, well, even philosophy. You know, perhaps, as you will know, uh, about the cave of Plato. He somehow this, had that idea, maybe this what you see, it's not a real world, but we only see shadows of something which happens somewhere. So in our sense, those objects I showed to you, they are projections of this set of quantum states which live in many dimensional space, so we don't know how they look like. But like uh, in the story of Plato, we can only look at the shadows of their shadows and the two plane or three plane. So here are some examples of all those possible uh, three-dimensional objects. So here we took three-dimensional projections of set of mixed states of size 8. Or in other words, we took three Hermitian matrices of size 3 and looked at those objects and classified them. So we understand a little bit. Okay, in apophatic approach, I can tell you how the state does not look like. In a constructive approach, I can tell you well. I don't know exactly how it looks like in eight dimensions, but I know a lot, lot how its projections onto a two plane or three plane look like. Okay, perhaps you are tired. You are in the physics department, and I'm talking about such strange things like operators and local ranges, so you can be bored and can ask a question, where is the physics? Why do I care about it? So first, a question, what is physics? I'm sure you have a good answer to it if you talk to your students. I will show you a ball, and if you kick a ball, what we know, the ball will stop at some point, even if you kick very hard. If you buy an ice cream, what will happen? What will happen? Ice cream will melt if you don't eat them on time. And then, if you create an entangled state and do nothing, similar situation, it will decohere to a separable state. Like ice cream will melt because of thermodynamics, here because of friction, they will stop, and here because of inevitable contact with environment, entangled states will lose their quantum features, they will become classical states. So now I promise you to tell something about entanglement. What is entanglement? First of all, we need to discuss quantum mechanics for composite systems. Composite systems we describe in Hilbert space, which has the structure H A tensor H B. This is a strange sign of the tensor product. But practically, physically, we say we have two objects like A and B. So separable state, this is the pure state, is any state of this product form. And entangled states are those which are not of this form. For instance, the very famous Bell state, we say it's like 0, 0, plus 1, 1, it has two terms. So this part has this form, it's a product state. 0, 0 means, uh, let me write, just to convention, it's like this, 0, 0 is equal to, okay, sometimes I write here comma, it is sometimes zero A tensor zero B, which basically means I have two objects, like this object and this object, and the separable states is like variables which are not correlated, independent. So one object is here, one is there, they do not talk together. Well, I have I got here two Mexican coins. I have never played with Mexican coins, I don't know how to build the behave. But let's assume I do the following experiment. So of course, we know what is heads or tails. Let's assume they are fair coins. I hope in Mexico you have fair coins. So probability to get uh, heads is 50%. Oops. So, well, let's imagine I throw it, it goes some time, so it's better for me to you make this. Okay, so I have one coin which is still in the motion, and I have another one. And let's assume I make such an experiment. Two coins are still in movement. And now I claim, I make movement like this, and I tell you, well, every time I got here one, I will say I will also get one here. Will you believe me? Is it possible? Mathematically? No. Physically, you will say no, I must be cheating. You will check that I have two coins, whether they are fair coins. How come it's possible that there is a relation between the outcome of measurement here and there? Of course, you will say it's not possible, yes? 
In some sense, it is not possible. However, what is the key point? Key point is that in physics, okay, in a sense, there is a philosophical question why we cannot, describing small objects, we cannot predict outcome of a measurement deterministic. We can only say something probabilistic, with some certain probability. Here, we have a bipartite system, and we can describe this system in the larger Hilbert space. So in a sense, we treat those two objects still like a single object. So in this way, this separable state is equally good state from the mathematical perspective as this base state. This base state only means that there are two objects which interacted in the past and they still have strong correlation. So it's not like this, that there's something special that uh, there is kind of interaction at the long distance. No. All axioms of relativistic uh, physics are satisfied. We cannot influence the result of the measurement. But if this state is in the entangled state, there are correlations between outcomes of result. And indeed, making a measurement here, I can guess what will be the outcome of the measurement there, provided this state is still in this entangled state. Which is usually not the case, because this entanglement, unfortunately, suffers the coherence and the state, quantum state, gets back to the classical case. To characterize degrees of entanglement, you well, can use many different ideas, but the simplest one is to take this projector onto the state we analyze and co compute partial trace. It's called reduce the matrix. And now to check whether this matrix is mixed or pure. To do it, we define standards for normal entropy. So this is for normal entropy, minus trace rho log rho sigma log sigma. And this is a quantity which describes entanglement of the initial pure state. Because if the state is product, partial trace is still a pure state, its entropy is zero. And for dense state, partial trace is maximally mixed. We do not know nothing about partial trace, and the entropy is maximal. So in short, the more mixed the partial trace, reduced density matrix, the more entangled initial pure state. Well, here, well, our, this is just a kind of, again, cross-section of this, you know this already, yes, of the space of two qubit pure states. So we define four basis states like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And here you can see at this edge, you have a 0 here. So this is an edge which corresponds to separable states. Here also separable because it's 0 at the front. However, here at this line, you have entanglement because you have 0, 1, plus 1, 0, so superposition of those two states will be entangled. So the colors here denote entropy of entanglement. Blue means separable states, and red means high entanglement, high entropy of entanglement. So there are two states here at this plot which are maximally entangled, and you can see that in some sense, degree of entanglement corresponds to the distance to the set of separable states, which is here, uh, uh, is given by those four edges. By the way, we like somehow this picture. So it was by the way, this picture was done just we took a picture of this object, which already it has like 15 years, so it's a bit not so new. But you will see now we use this picture for the cover plot of the first uh, edition of our book. I wrote with Ingemar Bengtsson. So his name should be here. So Ingemar Bengtsson is from Sweden. And then we were invited to write the second edition. And in the second edition, the cover story, this is such a strange object. It's called Borromean Rings. Because we discuss multi-party entanglement. I will uh, go to this uh, later. So there are such a rings that if you cut one ring, the chain goes apart. Any one of those, if you uh, uh, dismantle, then you can see here, uh, then all others will go apart. Well, so, for mixed states it's more complicated. For mixed states, so density matrices, if they are defined on the bipartite system, again we discussed that separable mixed states, they are just convex combinations of product states, and entangled mixed state is any of not of this form, this definition is consistent with the previous one for pure states. 
Mm, yes. Um, and then there's a question. This is a non constructive definition. Because if you, I give you a mixed state for a density matrix, it's difficult to guess whether such a form exists or not. So there's a key question which was posed some 20 years ago. How to find sufficient criteria to check whether such a, for a given state, such an expression exists? So how to find whether a given state is separable or not? For the last 20 years, people know that those problems are already well understood in the simplest case, like two times two, so two qubits, or one qubit and a qubit. But for higher dimensions, we know many, many partial results, but the separability problem is still open. For two qubit system, there is very nice theorem by Paris from Israel and the family of Horodetsky, Horodetsky uh, family. So Horodetsky is pluralist in Polish of Horodetsky. They are son, uh, sorry, father and three sons, and they work together. So the criteria is the following. T is here a transposition, and one permissible T is partial transposition. It means I have two objects, and in one subspace I make a transposition, I do not touch the other. It seems innocent in mathematics on the blackboard, but you cannot realize it in real world. However, on the blackboard it is easy to be done, and then the theorem says that I define this by partial transpose, T2, because I perform transposition on the second subsystem, and the statement is that for two qubit system, if this partially transposed matrix is positive, then the state is separable. In a sense, that this denotes the set of all mixed states. Partial transposition is like a reflection. So this is partially transposed set. So set of so-called PPT, positive partial transpose, is just an uh, intersection of the initial set and its reflection. And then this is a very simple theorem which tells us that those states here are separable while those outside this set are entangled. But for more, uh, for higher dimensions, this theorem works only one direction. So, um, well, almost 20 years ago, in fact, yeah, more than 20 years ago, uh, we had a paper in which we first discussed the simplest case of two qubits, and we could show that the center of the body of mixed states, here I denote the tetrahedron of spectra, so eigenvalues, four eigenvalues of density matrix of size four. There are four numbers which sum to unity, it's tetrahedron. And we show that if you have spectrum which is sufficiently close to the center of the tetrahedron, then the set is separable. In fact, entire maximally ball in the set of eigenvalues corresponds to a separable state. So this is like a first result in this direction. Okay, and then here is a cross section of this uh, 15 now dimensional body, which is complicated again to guess. By the way, I want to understand first the structure of the set of full set of density matrices to be able then to understand better the properties of the set of separable states and entangled states. Here you see at this cross section, uh, this here is this maximal ball, those white is. Uh, separable state, here black is entangled, and the more black, the more entangled states, those two points corresponding to maximally entangled states. They are those states which were, uh, base states which were read here. And in a sense you see that the degree of entanglement can be interpreted as a, for any state here row, as a distance, closest distance to the boundary of this set. Well, so here is a picture of Stefan Banach at his bench. <laughs> And the last part I will tell you of this talk, I will tell you something about dynamics. We are not only interested about the set of mixed states. The set is like a scene where some uh, action can be put in, but we really want to describe action, something is, uh, yes, something happens. So some, we allow for some dynamics. So indeed, this dynamics is complicated. We don't know how to describe it very precisely, it's so simple. So, we make several approximations. Simple approximation is so-called stroboscopic approach. So you close your eyes, and then you open for a while, you make a picture, and so on. So you have a discrete time. So now you discuss a maps which map the set of mixed states, for any equal to like a ball, and map the set into itself. So time is discrete. And then you can, in physics you can say, oh, you can take your state and extend it by environment, allow unitary matrix to 
uh, couple those two subsystems and take partial trace. So in this way you have a non-unitarity. Or you can have this Krauss form in which there are uh, arbitrary number of Krauss or measurements operators written in this way to preserve the trace, those Krauss operators AI satisfy such an identity resolution. And those two pictures are equivalent even though neither of those is unique. So you have many different expressions or way to represent such a map in this form or that form. So, there are some models for dynamics, so I will not go too much into details, but for the simplest system, 2 times 2 is 4, I have 2 qubits, so I have 2 spins somehow, I make some assumptions how they behave in time, and I study entanglement, how entanglement changes in time. As simple as that. So there is exactly written those so it's called so-called powering channels. Fortunately, Carlos is here, so if I go back home, he knows a lot about powering channels, and David, they can answer all your questions, I hope. So this is a simple model, kind of powering channel, which is simple, and eventually what I show here, this is time dependence of entanglement. At the beginning, what you are thinking? Well, usually entanglement will decay. It is usually so. so often you observe such an exponential decay just because those channels describe interaction with environment, entanglement decays. It's not so interesting. However, sometimes it happens, we observe such a revivals of entanglement, we try to understand why it is so. It's even more interesting, you can observe such a thing. Entanglement gets uh, killed, for some time there is nothing, when you observe a no revival. In the first scenario, later when there was a paper, so we had a paper with Horvetsky family, 2001, there was a later paper by Yao and Eberly, and they coined the name sudden death of entanglement. This is the case if entanglement dies immediately and stays there forever. It's also possible it dies and then it appears again. So at the beginning we were a bit confused, some 20 years ago. We could not understand why it is so. Now we understand the situation a bit better. Now look. Our geometric approach helps. Because now we understand that this was the picture, such a sketchy picture. We had already the idea that here is the set of all separable states. I showed you before such a cross-section, and there is dynamics. If you observe such a dynamics, it goes fast to the center, and that element will die. Why? Because we go from the set of entangled states to the uh, gray set of separable and stay there forever. However, you have such a rotations, you could have a revivals. But now, uh, this picture, so this was like artist plot. And this is the plot obtained with this numerical shadow technique. So this is just a sketch, and this is a really trajectory which you can put onto uh, numerical range and numer numerical, uh, of the, and this is so-called separable numerical range in gray, which corresponds to the projection of the set of separable states. So now we can understand these dynamics with our tools much better. I think I have to speed up. So last remark I want to mention that these um, Borromean rings are related to three parted states. For two qubits everything is simple. By the way, we know that three is larger than two. In this field, three is much larger than two. In what sense? For Two qubits or two qubits, it's enough to use single event decomposition of a matrix, and basically we know everything. For three parties, we need to work with tensors, which is much more complicated, and therefore everything becomes for multi party systems, the entanglement is much, much, much more complicated. However, for the simplest case of multi party entanglement, is three qubits. I have three systems A, B, and C, and then I distinguish GHZ states, which looks like this 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1. Very simple generalization of the so-called Bell state. And it has this unique uh, property that if you choose any subsystem and make partial trace with respect to both parties, the reduced matrix is proportional to identity. And other property is if you make a measurement of one party, the remaining state will be Separable. So therefore, this is in relation to Borromean rings. If you cut one ring, those two others will go apart. Which is not always the case. For other states like W, this is not the case. I think I should conclude. So, our approach is useful for people working not only for quantum information, but also in the foundations of quantum theory. In quantum computing, well, there is such a picture I took from paper of Gil Kalai, who shows here the classical computing. 
and then the quantum computing expected, so such a um, mountain far away, you are not sure you can see it, and then possibly there are some bridges from one place to another uh, that you can really go through. But what is the key point? We have taken into account noise and interaction with environment. So now we are not sure whether there is really a bridge, so you can really fight with all those problems which make quantum computing difficult. So from the mathematical theory to the real life, it's still a long way when there's such a bridge really exists, we will see, I hope, soon. So, here are some concluding remarks. I think I will skip them. If you wish to talk to me, I'm here this afternoon and next week on Thursday and Friday. I'm very, very thankful for this invitation. But then I will show you again now, this is the bench. And you see Nikodim, Otto Nikodim talking to Stefan Banach in summer 1916. This bench was erected and opened uh, exactly 100 years later after this discussion. If you ever come to Krakow, please do. Please come, sit here, and listen what they have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, about this revival of entanglement. Yes. Does it mean that entropy decreases? Mm, okay, very good question. So it's not correlated. It could mean this, but okay, I will go back quickly. In a sense, for pure states, entropy, a phenomenon entropy is zero. It becomes larger and larger if the state gets more and more mixed. But here there are two effects. Independently, it can go trajectory, can go to the center, so entropy increases. And then usually the entanglement goes down. However, if you have such a trajectory for which this entropy increases small, so the trajectory does not hit the center, it can go many times around. Unitary evolution is just rotating. So there are two competing effects. One is the coherence and state gets mixed and mixed entropy increases. So trajectory goes closer to the center. And second is the rotation. The trajectory can go many times through the set of separable states. So therefore you see each time you go into here, the set of separable states, the entanglement decreases. If it goes out, it revives again. So it may happen many, many times. Uh, in this geometric picture of entanglement, what do entanglement witnesses look like? Or what do they do to the geometry of the space? Okay, nice question. So, in a sense, if you have two qubits, the space of all states is 15 dimensional, and then we distinguish subset of separable states and subset of entangled states. So, first we want to analyze how the smaller subset of entanglement states is located. And then we want to see, for instance, to analyze, we cannot basically analyze dynamics in 15D so easily. So we look at the projection. So this picture, again, is exactly kind of projection of this 15-dimensional set onto the plane. So you see here, this is projection of separable state, and this projection of set of entangled state. So the trajectory goes here. It's a real trajectory for a model I described before. It goes via the set of entangled states, through the separable here, gray, goes again outside, so there's a revival, and the next revival, and then goes here, so there are two revivals, and in a sense, with this picture, you can understand those effects, which people somehow observed many years ago without deeper understanding. And then it's easier for us to predict for a given trajectory uh, what scenario we'll find. Okay. Thought about the relation of this material, quantum entanglement, with recent attempts in the last years of generating space-time geometry from quantum entanglement. Yes, uh, I see. I understand the question. Well, in a sense, this is relatively simple quantum mechanics. So basically, it's like algebra of matrices of size four, nine, or fifteen, and. What we are talking about is much more sophisticated and complicated. However, there is something in common between similar techniques and similar measures of entanglement. But it's not so much directly related. But the entanglement is the same, and the same idea and similar tools. That in yes. Yeah, yeah. It is somehow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many papers are quoted in both fields together.
Thank you very much. Thank you for your presence.